Last week, when we left Jesus in the garden, he was standing while those who had come to arrest him had fallen to the ground. Do you remember that scene? That moment often reminds me of uh, a prophecy that's captured in a song, a hymn that the ancient church used to sing to each other. It's in Philippians chapter 2. It's a passage you know very well. Even as I start the words, you'll remember. As they sang about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Those soldiers came thinking they had power, but they encountered God revealed in Jesus, and they collapsed in his presence. Even Peter helps us understand Peter's brief rebellion, sword in hand, attempting to protect his understanding, his design of who Jesus is. It crumbled. Not because the guards came against him, but because Jesus spoke. Put your sword away. Jesus is the one with authority. He spoke and caused this hostility to end because he's in charge of this moment in the garden as he's arrested. He is in charge. And as we continue reading, even today we'll discover that in his trial, Jesus remains in charge, allowing It's a remarkable scene, allowing his creation to do their worst. We continue reading in John 18. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and with the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? When Annas sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. 
Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. I want to make sure that we see what John is doing in his gospel, especially in this moment. And so to help us with that, I want to contrast it with uh, the other gospels, the words taken from Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 60. And you'll recognize these words as well. They're spoken by the other three gospels. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Did you notice the difference? The other Gospels present Jesus as remaining silent before his accusers. They speak their lies and he has no reply. But here in John, Jesus speaks. That shouldn't surprise you. It's not different. The other gospel writers are trying to make sure that you see the revelation, the fulfillment of prophecy. But John wants to make sure you understand who's speaking. Why is he speaking? And what truth is he presenting? So here in John, Jesus speaks to reflect the theme that John uses at the beginning of his gospel. So Jesus speaks and says, I have spoken openly to the world. You guys want to guess what that word is? Cosmos. I have spoken openly to the cosmos. It's the same word that we saw at the beginning of John's gospel. And in chapter 3, for God so loved the cosmos that he sent his one and only son. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. That word can also mean I haven't hidden anything. Jesus speaks to the entire cosmos in the Gospel of John, and he has kept nothing hidden. He has revealed completely who God is. He has revealed himself. And John has told us again and again, God has made himself known and we have refused to see. So the beginning of John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Can you see the picture that John's trying to paint? It's the same story from beginning to end. We need to have the scales removed from our eyes in order for us to see the glory of God revealed to his creation through God the Son. And we refuse to see This entire exchange reminds me of something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Well, it sounds like some guys in a room telling lies, doesn't it? Warping the truth so that they can make their plan be the one that's carried out. But since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So men are without excuse. 
in this moment, as Jesus stands on trial, accused of being a criminal, in this moment, the Son of Man, the heir of heaven, bears the authority of God and stands in the presence of his creation, and there is a reversal that is going on. Just as the soldiers thought they had power, but Jesus is the one with power, so too these priests think that they hold power over Jesus, and specifically they think they hold the power of God over Jesus. The irony. But they have wrapped their power in lies. They know that they're lies. They've brought false accusations against Jesus to make sure that they can try him as a criminal knowing he has committed no sin. They know it. But it's better that he die. So they wrap their accusations in the lies that they create rather than to acknowledge the reality of the one who stands before them, the Messiah. And so they speak their lies. And what does Jesus do? He speaks truth. I have hidden nothing. The truth is revealed. Humanity has spoken lies. In the presence of God, who has clearly revealed himself. Creation testifies. God speaks, and his world word reveals the truth. He exists. He alone has authority, and he has spoken to all creation, to the entire cosmos, and we have rejected the truth. It's on display for us right in front of these men. They reject the truth and accept and defend the lies. We have accused God of being uncaring, unkind, unconcerned. These are lies. The world is filled with these lies. If God existed, he would... If there is a God, he doesn't care. Satan is as powerful as God. I heard that one yesterday. But God has declared the truth. He is the only God. He is the only creator. And Jesus is the revelation of God, the creator. And that is his crime. That's why he's on trial. And we all know it, because we're on this side of the story, aren't we? Why is Jesus about to die? Because he's God in the flesh. And we're going to kill him. We will stand in judgment of God, speaking our lies, declaring our truth, while the truth speaks and says, for God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. God stands right in the midst of his creation revealed, nothing hidden, no secrets. God is, Jesus speaks and says, I am. He speaks and says, the I am is, but we have rejected that reality and sought to proclaim ourselves gods, masters of our own fate. And this one keeps being told, the most powerful beings on the planet. We can affect change at a grand scale because we're powerful. Let's build a monument. To ourselves. We continue to speak lies, and each of us has bought into the lies, turned from the truth, and worshiped false gods of our own design. 
That's the judgment of God against humanity, against his creation. And in this moment, John paints the picture in the light. While it's nighttime and darkness and men gather around the fire to warm themselves, light stands in a courtroom accused of being a criminal. And yet we know, we know the story. There is a reversal going on. Jesus appears powerless and yet he holds the power. Jesus stands as the criminal accused and yet we are the criminal. And what is our crime? Rebellion. And God is the one in judgment of humanity. We have indeed rebelled. And yet again, a reversal is taking place. God will take our punishment on himself. Jesus will stand and allow himself to be struck. God will speak and humanity will strike. He will allow himself to be abused, rejected, mocked. God will allow all of that because we have rejected the light, the life of men, the glory of God, and we have chosen death. So Jesus died for you. Can you see the picture John is trying to paint? As Jesus stands and you hear the lies spoken of him, can you see him? He will take your cross. He will take your shame. He will take your sin. And the reversal is at work because guess what will happen? God will not die. Well, he won't stay dead. And you will not remain in your sin. You'll be freed. Jesus will claim victory. And as John wrote right at the beginning of his gospel, in chapter 1 and verse 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right. I want you to pause and think about that. We Americans love our rights, don't we? I have the right to my own opinion. In fact, my opinion's right and yours is wrong. We love our rights. So I want you to notice what God has done through Jesus. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of of God. The Word became flesh and He made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus stands while all of creation must confess we are guilty. We have believed the lies. We have rejected God. We know we are condemned. And yet, the reversal is going on. Jesus saves. He saves. And so I want to end with this question that John highlights so well. Will you confess that you know Jesus? I'm one of his followers. Or will you stand like Peter? Say, I don't know him. I'm not one of his followers. To confess that Jesus is exactly who he said he is, the Son of God, the Word of God, God in the flesh is to accept the authority of Jesus, to bow before him and confess, Jesus 
is Lord. Will you claim to know him or will you reject him? Will you allow yourself to be bought to believe the lies or will you confess Jesus is Lord? To believe in the one who has been revealed and to claim the right to be a child of God. If you're here this morning and you've never confessed Jesus as Lord, we want to encourage you to do that. To profess Jesus is Lord. To participate in baptism in his death. To be resurrected with Christ, raised from water, a child of God. To be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if you're a believer and you're here this morning and you need the prayers of the saints, the church, to encourage and strengthen your heart so that you have the courage to say, I know Jesus, to a world very dark. They need us to confess that Christ is, that he is the Son of God and that he holds authority. Whatever your need is this morning, I hope that you'll make it known as we stand together and sing.